What happens when Christians sin? This is part seven. Continuing from last week, God's judgment and the flow of human history. I had a conversation not all that long ago with a pastor in this area, and we were just sharing, and I was explaining to him something that at that time God was just doing in my own heart, and just because of my... Um, trying to think of another word other than failure, but I can't think of a better one. Just because of my failure to listen immediately when God began to speak to my heart, I was just sharing with this this, uh, brother, I know fairly well, how God was just kind of, and I think I used the phrase, I think I used the phrase, God had sort of just kind of taken me to the woodshed. I know nobody says that anymore, but Look around to people that are 60 and over and that, like, they know what that phrase at least means. And he was very quick with kind of a rebuke that, no, 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 God doesn't, God doesn't do that. Jesus bore all the punishment for human sin. And God doesn't deal with us like that. God just deals with us with patience and love drawing us to himself. Now, There's a sense in which what he said was absolutely true. We sing it. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. And it's true. But it's not the whole truth. And so what we've been studying for a couple of weeks is the way God works in this world... The day will come, the day will come when one minute after either the resurrection or Jesus comes again, we will never have to worry about sin again. But that's not yet. And God uses all sorts of means to wake us up to open our hearts to his grace and sometimes very firm ways that he has of dealing with us. That's what we're studying in this series. In our last study in this series, we were considering two key ideas as we started unpacking the revelation of God's judgment, chastising, and those words sometimes are used interchangeably in the New Testament. The revelation of God's judgment in the flow of human history. The first idea that we looked at last week was our own fallen minds are not reliable instruments for making assessments about the righteousness of any of God's acts of judgment. Our minds are too finite, too bound by thin slices of time and thin slices of perspective, and we're too self-centered Uh, We're too inclined just to personal happiness and personal comfort to see anything good that God might do that disturbs our personal happiness and comfort. And so our own fallen minds are not really reliable instruments for measuring God's actions. And the second thing we started studying was God's judgment... uh, God does not always act unilaterally in judgment in the present flow of history of this world, but always with the goal of his greatest good being accomplished. Okay? Let me put that in a smaller sentence. Um, God's acts, even acts of stern judgment in this world, are always avenues for his grace ultimately being manifested. And under that second idea, that even when God judges, there are elements of grace that he's trying to pull into it. We looked at the idea that God's judgments are never hurried or impulsive. If you remember, we studied, we studied that parable Jesus told of the barren fig tree and the master's command to have it removed and how that looks quite harsh, but it's, it's always presented against the backdrop of 
of the master had come for three years looking to find fruit, patiently waiting for any sign of development. And then we considered, secondly, that even God's severe judgments are intended as examples, turning people away from wickedness to grace and mercy. Peter makes that point. We read it last week, 2 Peter 2, 4 to 6, where he talks about, especially the sixth verse, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So, even when God judges, even when God... Uh, works sternly and firmly in the circumstances of history, there's this texture of grace in it. Other people might be awakened. Other people might turn from their sin. Other people might, might take seriously God's word. You see, there's a problem that we all have. We sang at the beginning of this service. You probably did. I did. We sang... We sang, we have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. But it's not true, is it? All sorts of people are probably in this room right now who, who don't have open hearts. There are people in this room right now, in South Sanctuary as well, there are people in this room to whom God has spoken over and over again about the way you don't take him seriously and you really don't honor him moment by moment. And you're not open to making that change. There are people here who are living in some kind of open disobedience to the Lord. And you enjoy the songs and you like the worship and you, you kind of have good friends in the church. But there are areas of your life that you've just sectioned off and said, mine. And so your heart isn't open. It's not open. And so God pleads. He waits like three years waiting for that tree to bear fruit. He just waits and he pleads. You have friends, you have parents, you have a husband, you have a wife, people who pray and try. But your heart isn't open. So what does God do? Well, he, he, the thing is, you see, and this is where my pastor friend was dead wrong. He loves us too much just to leave us like that. He will shake things up for you. And frequently when that happens, people will get mad at God rather than seeing what, what else can he do? He, he will get your attention. And it's still under this second point. The idea that even when God pours out judgment, there's an element of grace in it. And those two examples that we looked at last week, how he waits patiently. And secondly, how he, even when he judges others, there's an example for us. But still under that second point, that, that even God's judgment in this world has the texture of grace behind it, I have a third example that I want to look at. So we're under point two, C, if we're doing it that way, from last week. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. I tried to do that in about five minutes. Do you feel like you're sort of caught up where we were studying and where we're at, all right? Acts 5, 1 to 10. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And I would remind you, this is New Testament now, not Old Testament. Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it, laid it at the apostles' feet. The idea there is, not that they were ever required to give any of it or all of it, but the idea was they planned this thing together to make it look like they were giving everything when they really weren't. It's the deceit. It's not the amount that's the issue here. Verse 3. 
Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? You can do whatever you want with it, Peter's saying. That's not the problem. Why is it that you have, here's the word, contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. So the Holy Spirit, back in verse 3, is God. This is where your doctrine of the Trinity starts to form up. Five, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. It's not what we usually mean when we sing, Oh Lord, send the power just now. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. I guess so. The young men rose, wrapped him up. Can you imagine this in the middle of a service? Wrapped him up, buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in. So the service is still going on. See if you think you have it bad. His wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Here's the, here's the, here's the amount. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. Wow. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came and found her dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. What is that all about? I mean, why do we need that in our Bibles? Like Sodom and Gomorrah, here we see this strong picture of God's judgment being poured out. The sin exposed is that of hypocrisy, sham, dishonesty in the practice of worship and congregational life. I mean, we all know that God doesn't approve of those things, but that's not the issue here. The issue here is what are the consequences of ignoring what we know is right in our relationship with the Lord, in our worship? What difference does it make when we don't please the Lord in these things and yet we just push past the promptings of the Holy Spirit? What difference does it make? Lots of times, none at all outwardly. Sometimes it does, though. Look what happened as a result of God's judgment on Ananias and Sapphira. It's in 11 to 14. Great fear came upon the whole church and all who heard about these things. Many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people at the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women. So was it a bad thing? Was it a good thing? This is exactly the kind of reaction Peter said the message of judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah would have on its hearers. There'd be an example. This is the mercy of God, the stern mercy of God being made manifest in his acts of judgment in this world. Okay, point number three now. People can be judged by God temporally, I mean by that in this present age, and sometimes very severely, and yet not be eternally lost. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 to 32 Sorry, guys, up in the control room. I was asleep there for a minute with the iPad. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 to 32. Paul goes through all sorts of instructions about how, how we should come together around the Lord's table. And he says in verse 28, Let a person examine himself, and then so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For everyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body, and that's, that's this body, not, not the body on the cross, discerning the body, the church. 
Everyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment. There's the word on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. This isn't something God wants to do. If, 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 we would just, if we would just be honest looking into our own hearts, that's God's desire. But we don't all come with open hearts, do we? If we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, and, and here he says, he uses the word judged, clear enough, Judged by the, it's by the Lord, by the way. So when he talks about these people, they're weak, ill, dead. Okay, he's not talking about something Satan does. We're all clear on that, right? I mean, the text will not let you walk away with that interpretation. When we are judged by the Lord, then he says we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. These are some of the richest words on the subject of divine judgment in this present world in the whole Bible. No wonder Paul encouraged their consideration. He said, think about this at least as often as you come to the Lord's table. We do that twice a month, usually twice a month. And to me, it's just striking. It's striking that we're reminded of God's judgment at the very point where we're most prompted to celebrate His mercy and grace and love. I mean, that's what, that's what we think of when we come to the cross. When we come to the Lord's table, we're thinking of how Jesus died for the ungodly. We're thinking of how He took our sin upon Him. We're thinking of how He bore God's wrath. We're thinking of how we get His mercy instead of what we deserve. We all come around the table thinking about God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And, and, then, and then Paul says, now, every time you come, I want you to look into your own heart and to remember God's judgment. Not on Jesus, on you. Am I making it up? It is there, isn't it? It's there. And the reason is, we need to know God's grace can easily take forms we don't immediately relish. So these words from Paul, they're just custom-tailored to remove false thinking about God's judgment in this present age like that pastor friend was sharing with me. Consider just two thoughts from that 1 Corinthians 11 passage. First, God's judgment is never given merely to assert His divine muscle. It's not like a bare threat. The word judgment. Diachronomen is the word. And it literally means to separate, to distinguish, to discern. He uses it in verse 31. But if we judged or discerned or distinguished ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But, but there's a problem. We, we don't. Sometimes we come and we assume. We assume because we said a sinner's prayer when we were 19 or 7. We go to church regularly. We preach sermons. We sing or play, we usher, we're on the board, whatever it might be. We assume that there, I, I have this position before God and, and everything seems pretty good. Thank you. I know I'm not perfect. So Paul says, you know, you need to think through how seriously God will pursue your holiness. And so Paul sees God's message of a graceful judgment, a severe mercy at the table, not simply as something to be feared, not just a divine display of temper, but God's purifying work, an incentive to holiness, an incentive to serious self-examination. 
We go through month after month after month of our walk with Jesus without serious examination of our hearts. And God says, I love you too much to let that go on like that. The second idea from this passage is, this earthly judgment of the Lord is not the same thing as eternal damnation. Ananias and Sapphira, and the text doesn't say, but you shouldn't just assume from reading that text that they go to hell. I mean, the text doesn't say that. They're, they're punished for a sin, and God does it in a way that purifies the whole body. But we have, at least in this passage, some better evidence, some clearer statements than we have in the Ananias and Sapphira passage. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 32 is very clear. But when we are judged by the Lord, that is, when people are sick, weak, or die, when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Right? That's the idea. Paul says, yes, Christians do experience God's judgment. That's not my word. He calls it God's judgment. Verse 32, but when we are judged by the Lord. I don't know how you, I don't know how you open a Bible and say Christians never receive any judgment from God. But, says Paul, this judgment, even when it's severe in its manifestation isn't to bring about eternal damnation. It's to keep us from experiencing that kind of condemnation along with the world, just like everybody else. I won't, God says, I won't let you live life like everybody around you. Not if you're professing me. And so we need to constantly remember this. The thing is, God can't be properly understood if his passion for our purity and separation from the world is forgotten. I want to close point number four. And this is the closest to my heart as we wrap up. The kind of judgment we should fear the most. I suppose it would be easy it would be easy for anyone to read those words in 1 Corinthians 11 and think, I sh I, boy, I need to be really careful. And I just have respect for that attitude. I think sometimes it gets, it gets blown out of proportion in our lives where people, instead of coming to the table, bringing our sin and our weakness, crying out to God, receiving His grace, I think sometimes people just say, I, I don't really plan on forsaking this sin, so I should just stay away from the table. And that's not God's intention at all. But I can understand people fearing that kind of judgment. Here's the kind of judgment to fear the most. And I don't think people worry about it. I'm constantly amazed that Christians get all worked up about passages like those mentioning Ananias and Sapphira and the words we just read from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, and yet not breathe a word about the most severe judgment recorded anywhere in the pages of Scripture outside of eternal damnation. The most severe judgment. And I'd like you to consider with me Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 22, and I want to talk about these as we wrap up. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God, so that, that's what we're talking about, there's the subject. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against, it's revealed from heaven. And he's talking about is. This is now. This isn't when Jesus comes again. Is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who by their unrighteousness, here's what, here's what people do. They suppress, that's the verb, they suppress the truth. We have come with open hearts. 
No. Lots of people come to church who don't have open hearts. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His divine attributes, His eternal power, divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking then it says, their foolish hearts were darkened, darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Now these verses describe the end result of a very severe kind of judgment. But there's a very important phrase that describes the process of judgment that brought about this terrible condition. This one key phrase is all important when we consider the manifestation of God's judgment in this present age. It's repeated three times. I'm going to look at each verse. It's repeated three times for great emphasis. Please consider this phrase with great care today. Give this great attention today. Here are the verses where this phrase is found. Romans 1, 24. Therefore God, and here it is, gave them up to the lusts of their hearts. Now understand what's being said here. If you think of the lusts of their hearts and you read the whole chapter, you'll see that there are all sorts of perversions mentioned there. But lusts of the heart includes those things but is broader than those things. He's talking about, he's talking about inward desires. The inward desires people have to, to um, carry on in certain areas of their life on their own terms rather than God's. That's what he's talking about. Desires. I, this is what I want. These are the friends I want. This is the way I want to spend my money. This pleasure is so important to me. This habit is too hard to renounce. Okay, a desire. It's my way. So God says, gave them up. Gave them up. God lets their inward desires overrule the authority, the truth of His Word, and the voice of the Holy Spirit that speaks in conscience. If it still speaks to you, see that as unbelievably precious that He still speaks to you. God lets their inward desires overrule the truth of His Word, the voice of the Holy Spirit in their conscience. He leaves them to do what they want in a, in a, a numb kind of inner peace. It just, it's okay now. That's judgment indeed. The second place, the same phrase is found, is Romans 1.26. For this reason God, here it is again, gave them up. Do you see it? Gave them up to dishonorable passions. There it is again, just, just desires. He'll go on to talk about uh, homosexual desires. But it isn't just that. He gave them up to their inward desires. Same idea. God stops arguing with your inner inclinations. He's not arguing with you anymore. It's a, a numb, dead peace. You won't be bugged anymore. The third text is Romans one twenty eight.
And since they did not see fit, acknowledge. That means, that means respond. I mean, that's all God wanted. He, he talks to you. He calls you. He just wants, he just wants some kind of acknowledgement. Just, just don't ignore. My dad used to get, wow, so upset when we lived, uh, when we lived in Prince George, B.C., and they had a, in those days, 1961, 62, 63, they had a 10 o'clock siren in Prince George. It was, a, it was just a pure lumberjack town where the bars were packed at 10 o'clock and a loud siren went and everybody had to be off the streets because it just wasn't safe. That's a long time ago and it was, it's different now, but back then, that was a rough place. 10 o'clock siren would go. But long before that, my dad would yell out to the four Horban boys who'd be out fooling around, and, and we would pretend we didn't hear him. And, and that was death, let me tell you. you when someone calls, you, you acknowledge them. See this text? See this text? Since they, they didn't see fit even to acknowledge you're speaking to me. I'm going to close the service. Maybe give you a chance to say, I, you know what? God is speaking to me and I need to at least acknowledge him. It's just right. Okay. They did not see fit to acknowledge God and then here's the same phrase. God gave them up. Only here it says to a debased mind. Note, debased mind. That's slightly different from the previous two texts. God finally removes their ability to analyze and to measure their own misery correctly. Have you ever had that experience where you speak to someone, you see them, they're messing up their life, and you talk to them, and everybody looking at them could see what they're doing, but they can't see it? You ever had that experience? God finally removes their own ability to measure, to discern what's really happening. They can't, they can't see where they're going. They can't see their own future. So, so the wisdom control center of their life gets shut down. God gave them up. Very silently, very gradually. This isn't Sodom and Gomorrah. This is worse. This isn't someone being struck dead and dragged out. This is worse. Because nobody sees it happening. Nobody sees a line that's been crossed. Nothing checked their rebellion anymore. They don't feel the weight of their own sin. They don't blush. God, God just leaves. Am I wrong or we don't talk about this very much, do we? You know why? We, we can't bear to look at it. We can't bear to look at it. Pray every morning. Pray every morning. When you get out of bed, before you check and see what's on Facebook, before you see what tweets you've received, before you turn on the TV, before you do anything, pray every morning. Lord, don't take your spirit from me. Just keep talking to me. Don't let this happen in my heart. Pray every day your soul never reaches that horrible state. I think that's surely what David had on his mind in Psalm 5111. Cast me not away from your presence and, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I don't want to go there. 
anything but that. It is a terrible thing whenever Christians sin. The sitcoms make it funny. But our Lord still weeps when Christians sin. It's a terrible thing to grieve the heart of God. It's almost never easy to repent, to humble your own mind, turn from sin. It's never an easy process. But always remember, it's far more terrible to sin and inwardly feel total indifference. You think about these things when you're a pastor. Every pastor knows what it's like to preach to hard hearts over a long period of time. Every pastor knows what it's like to look out to a few cold, indifferent faces to precious truth that could help them, but they, they just don't acknowledge God. I fear for those people. Mister, your pride isn't uh, important enough to keep you from the altar. Teenager, young adult, there's not a friend on earth that's worth reaching this horrible condition. You can't turn your spiritual appetite on and off at will. You can fiddle with spiritual things too long. So always see, always see God's grace, even when He judges, even when it's stern. It's grace. The one thing you, the one thing you never want from God is His indifference. The one thing you never want from God is his indifference. God gave them up. In this age where we spend our lives, even his painful voice and ways have a lot of mercy in them. Listen now. Even if his voice and way seems difficult, even if you think he's calling you to humble yourself in a way that oh, would be difficult, his voice, patient or stern, always has more grace in it than his silence. His voice, patient or stern, always has more grace in it than his silence. 